G'day, Louis here, pastor at City on a Hill Surf Coast. Thanks so much for tuning into this video, a recap of a Bible talk from our recent Sunday gathering together. We understand that at the moment things are tough and uncertain with COVID-19, so we hope that this serves you well in feeling like you can still participate in the life of the church. I want to encourage you though to not let this be the only way that you participate in the life of the church. That during this time, although maybe you can't be there on a Sunday, look for ways to be able to be together in other ways. Uh, be creative, send a text, make a phone call, be with your gospel community, uh, catch up for coffee, go for a walk, do something where you can still be a part of our journey with Jesus so you can be encouraged and also so that you can encourage someone else. So we hope that this content today is helpful, that it encourages you and builds you up in knowing Jesus and making Jesus known. And we look forward to seeing you again soon on Sundays and throughout the week. Thanks, church. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Uh, we pray that these next few moments would be significant, that you'd be pleased to use them to comfort us, uh, to change us, to call us and to challenge us and to uh, help us um, in our journey with Jesus and to, to live the life that he's called us to live. We ask for your help and your, your mercies and your grace again this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I did ask us earlier on uh, not to be talking about COVID, which is obviously a very significant event in all of our lives. Uh, it's a once-in-a-lifetime event, I've heard it being called, a once-in-a-lifetime event, kind of like a world war or something like that, that, you know, that after this event, everything is different. Everything is different. You know, we've all been upskilled on Zoom now. You know, we all know how to use Zoom, which is pretty cool. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, we, you know, we all, we all know how to use a QR code. I never used a QR code before all of this. Anyway, QR codes, they're a thing. Um, but it's a once-in-a-lifetime once event where now everything is different. Today, uh, we're starting a new sermon series, and we're going to be looking at the text that Esther just read for us called The Great Commission. The Great Commission. It's the final few verses of the Gospel according to Matthew. And this Great Commission, this is the most significant event. It, 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 is, it is, and it's attached to the most significant event in all of human history where everything is now different. And the Great Commission, hey, look, it's not a virus that has taken the world captive. It's about a Jesus that has come to set the world free. So we've got the next four weeks to think about the Great Commission. Um, today is a bit of an overview uh, of what we're going to be thinking about. And then over the next four weeks, we're going to sort of dial in sort of one verse at a time. Um, and we're going to see how these final words of Jesus set forth a completely new way of life and what it looks like to live for and live with him. So I hope you've got your Bibles open, the Great Commission. Um, by the end of this series, I reckon we probably will, will probably will know it all off by heart. I hope so. Anyway, I hope so. What is the Great Commission? Have you heard of the Great Commission? Well, the Great Commission is Jesus' parting words that he, to, when he sends his followers out to the world before he ascends back up to heaven. Now, parting words are significant, aren't they? Parting words are significant. We all shared some very significant parting words over Christmas, didn't we? When we start to spend time with people that we love or tolerate, and you know, we, we, we were with them, and you know, the final things that we said, our parting words were the ones that were significant to us. Often we would say, you know, I hope you said, I love you. We want our parting words to be the ones that you know, are the most significant that people hear and hold on to. There's also like, you know, so there's some parting words that, that sort of make people famous. You know, like last words on people's deathbed. Um, two of my favourites that I came across this week. There's the parting words of the comedian Groucho Marx. He said, die? Well, that's the last thing I'm going to do. 
There's also the parting words of John Sedwick, who was the general of the Union Army, and he said, they couldn't hit an elephant at this dist. <laughs> yeah, he got shot mid-sentence. He was obviously the size of an elephant. The Great Commission is Jesus' parting words to his disciples, except they aren't said before his death. They are said after he has risen to new life after being put to death. Jesus' final words at his death are very significant, but these ones are the ones upon his resurrection, and they're his parting words before his ascension back to heaven. They are said by Jesus after his life, death, and resurrection. They are spoken by Jesus after years of his leading, teaching, miracles, and relationships. And they are words that solidify and summarize the next steps for his people. They are words for all those people that would seek to live a life to follow after him in response to what he has done. The Great Commission is the purpose of Jesus' people. It's the last command of Jesus, and it is to be the first priority of the church. The Great Commission is significant. This church exists because of the Great Commission. I can say with great confidence that... My studies, my life, my family, uh, we live in this part of the world because of the Great Commission. There's truth to the fact that you wouldn't be sitting here, right here, right now, if it wasn't for others obeying the Great Commission. The Great Commission is significant. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you until the end of the age. The Great Commission is the marching orders for the church. The last command of Christ is crucial to the life of the believer. It's not optional. It has been said that any church that is not seriously involved in helping fulfill the Great Commission has forfeited its right to exist. In the words of Spurgeon, every Christian is either a missionary or they are an imposter. You're either making disciples or you're making excuses. If you're a follower of Jesus... The Great Commission is not an added purpose to your life. It is the purpose of your life. It calls to mind the opening lines to this, this poem. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon its fleeting hours will be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. They say the Great Commission is so important because the only thing that Jesus is counting when he comes back is disciples. Friends, we should never underestimate, we should never undersell the significance of the Great Commission. But its words do not just sit on their own. Its words do not just sit on their own. For if they did, and if my sermon stopped here, if I just spoke about this charge from Jesus on its own, the Great Commission just sounds like an overwhelming job from Jesus, doesn't it? It just sounds like an overwhelming job. But it isn't. It isn't. There's some key information. There's key experience that Jesus assumes. 
when giving this command. Beautiful experience, wonderful information. And what is it that Jesus assumes when he gives his disciples this call to go? What is it that he what is it that he assumes? What is it that they know by now? Hopefully they know by now. Well, we only simply need to look at the context of when this command is communicated. When is it spoken? After his life, death, and resurrection. After. Jesus assumes that by this point, his followers have begun to come to grips with the reality of who he is and the reason of why he's come. Do you know the shorthand way of talking about that, church? We sing a song with its name at the beginning of every service. It's the gospel. Your experience, it's your experience of the gospel that needs to shape your engagement with the Great Commission. It's your experience of the gospel that has to shape your engagement with the Great Commission. To get the Great Commission, you need to get the gospel. Because at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ is this overwhelming joy to go and do all that he says and to follow who he is. The gospel is the engine that is powering and promoting the going and discipling to this world. The gospel, you know, the foolish, weak message of the life, death, and resurrection of the Son of the Most High God for the salvation of the, Lord, of the world. It's the good news of the gospel that ma- motivates Christ's mandate. It's the wonderful message of hope that energizes our evangelism. In the Great Commission, the gospel is the way into the family. It's the food for the journey. It's the message for the many. And it's the confidence when you are weary. The gospel is the good news of the kingdom of God, which is now here, ushered in by the person and work of Jesus, which means that everything is now different in this world. Everything. Perhaps you're new. Perhaps you haven't heard this message of the gospel before. Well, let me tell you we need to hear it again and again. I need to hear it again and again. The gospel is the good news that anyone, anyone can be saved from this wicked, dark and perverse generation if they trust in Jesus Christ. If they trust in who he is and what he has done. For those of us that have sensed our lostness, our blindness, our tiredness, our guilt, for those of us that are burdened and weighed down, that feel dirty and broken and, shame, and full of shame, we can have hope in Jesus. He shows us, he tells us, he models to us that if you go to him and if you give up your efforts to make yourself right, you can rest in his efforts to rescue you and make you right. We place our faith in his rescue, in his renewal, in his ability to make us right, not us. In and through Jesus, the gospel tells us the good news is that you can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness and being brought into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of God with Jesus as your king. It means, the gospel means that there's no more striving in life. The gospel means that there's no more recreating yourself. The gospel means there's no more reason to try and please or impress man. Because when you realize what God has done through his son, we see that we actually have God's approval and that's whose approval you need on the final day. The gospel is the good news of the free gift of eternal life to all who believe in and turn to and trust in Jesus Christ and commit to following him. Simply believe it and receive it. Simply turn from your own man-made security and senseless, self-pleasing, man-appeasing life And turn to God through his son. And know that as you do, you are already pleasing in the eyes of God. God's love for you is so vast, so wide, it's so high, it's so deep, 
that he was willing to take onto himself the punishment that your sin-stained life deserved. And Jesus says in the Great Commission that he is willing to accept your apology for your wrongdoing and that he is faithful and just to forgive you of all sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, to make you right from all the wrong that you've done. And it's a free gift from God. That is good news. That is awesome news. A renewed relationship with the Heavenly Father. Unhindered access to living water. Freedom, life, forgiveness, light. All through Jesus. Only through Jesus. And now Jesus in the Great Commission, on the backdrop that is the gospel, he says, it's the free gift. The job is finished. It's all done. Go and tell. Go and share. The Great Commission summarized in four words, go and get them. When I hear the Great Commission, I almost can feel Jesus saying to us, saying to me, come, come on. Come on, let's have some fun. Watch me and see what I can do in this world with this free gift that I've now purchased. Come to work with Dad Day. That is the Great Commission. Let's go. Come on. I'm inviting you into this journey so you get to see what happens when you share your story of what I have done in your life. And that forgiveness is for all who call upon the name of the Lord. Come on, let's go. Let's do this. Come. I already know everything about you. Come, let's go deeper. Let me show you who I am and what I can do. The Great Commission, it's the natural response of an overflowing joy because of Jesus. It's not an, overflow, it's not an overwhelming job from Jesus. I've actually enjoyed also thinking about, you know, if we really look at our life, if we really think about the way that we're all wired, we take a moment to examine ourselves. Deep down, everything we already love and enjoy, at the root of that enjoyment, there's a wiring to be a part of the Great Commission. I don't know if you noticed this, but deep down, for all people that are created in the image of God, if we actually take a look at the internal wiring of our hearts, we're already wired with a longing to be a part of the Great Commission. Whether we know it or not, we want to see and participate in the Great Commission. It's already in our DNA. That's how successful movies and books and stories are written. They're all a spin-off of the original and greater story of the Gospel and the Great Commission. They're all just a plagiarism of God's greater story for this world. Those great stories, they resonate with us because they're all tapping into this great command that's already there. The one that Jesus gives to his disciples. Have you realized this? Have you, have you thought? This has been so much fun to think about. The reason we find so many of the stories, stories in life engaging and exciting and enlivening, the reason is it's because they're touching onto a live wire in our hearts that is connected to the purpose-giving mission that Christ has commanded for all his people. At the bedrock of all of our fancies is the gospel and how the Great Commission intersects with it. How is this so? Well, the gospel is the rescue mission of God, isn't it? It's the total initiative and pursuit of God to seek out his people, his children, and to bring them home. The gospel is the right here, right now, good news that we who are once lost can be found. And how? Jesus Christ came in to pursue us. We just celebrated Christmas. God in flesh, God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. You were sought out by God, a mighty king, 
A mighty king considered you worthy enough to stoop down to your level and get his hands dirty and pull you out of your mess and your despair, even when you turned your back on him. That's the gospel. That's also the climactic moment in every story and fable and book and movie where the prince or the dude does something crazy or embarrassing like fight the dragon or fly overseas or perform some song to reclaim his love. The gospel is like God singing, ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough to keep me from getting to you. The gospel is the good news that we who are not a people can now be the people of God. How? Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, made adoption possible into the family of God. And how? Well, the gospel played out in your life means that God considered the hideously expensive price on your life as you sat on death row. He considered it worth paying so you might be free and in his family. That's his love. You were purchased by God. The judge and the father of this universe dug into his resources so that you could be freed. This is Jesus doing the original release and better version of Saving Private Ryan. This is the original Super Mario Brothers game. Jesus, the new and better Mario, who traverses perilous maps to save us. Princess Peach. Sought out, sacrificed for and fought for. Killing sin, Satan, Bowser, and death. The gospel and the Great Commission, it's, it's hardwired already into our hearts. We already have a love, a love and a longing to be a part of it and to see it played out. God, because of his great love, he considered it a good thing to do something unimaginable so that you could be a citizen in his kingdom and adopted into his family. The gospel, it's, at the, it's, at the, it's, it's the heart of the gospel and the Great Commission that, you know, that, that why, you know, that gives, that gives the beating heart to a tale of two cities, doesn't it? The sacrifice, the great exchange. It gives, you know, the, that romantic, wonderful moment with Mufasa and Darth Vader. One that would die so that another could go free. The mission of the Great Commission in the reality of the gospel it's what fuels the spirit of Anzac Day. That sacrifice was made so that life could be restored and others could have freedom. We all love these things. Why do we love these things? Because at the heart of these things, they're touching on the live wire in our heart, which is the great commission of Jesus Christ to go and share the gospel. The one that is good for us to know one that is right for us to walk in, the one that is the purpose of our lives as followers of Jesus. So then we sit back and we think, well, it's no wonder Jesus would then command this for us. It's no wonder. It's already in us. It's going to be good for us to live out this life in this way, in the right way. It's good for us that when you are living out the Great Commission in the confidence and in the power of the gospel, Jesus knows that you are going to be a finely tuned, well-oiled machine doing exactly what he's called you to do. That's why we're still here. If it was all about relationship and experience of God, the moment we're saved, we're in heaven. If it was all about that, we're gone straight away. But he keeps us here, doesn't he? He's got a job for us to do. Go and tell. Go and share. Go and get them. And along the way, let's, let's do relationship. Let's be a part of this journey together. But I can only say so much. Because you, you don't get to know this joy of living out the Great Commission unless you yourself, by faith, step into it and follow journey and journey with Jesus. Follow Jesus and journey with Jesus in obedience to his call. So I wonder if the Great Commission is not shaping much of your life, I wonder what's stopping you. 
For some of us, we don't walk in the Great Commission. We don't let the Great Commission, we don't let this command from Jesus Christ shape our life because we, we doubt, don't we? We doubt our ability. We are hesitant to be obedient. And maybe because, you know, maybe because we have a nervousness about stepping out in faith to share this foolish method, message with someone else. Maybe it's because we, we don't know enough yet. We don't feel that well equipped. Maybe we don't share because we're thinking we need to know some more stuff before we go and share that thing. Or maybe it's because we're just scared we'll stuff it up. Well, all of those things are me on a good day. But let me leave us with this, these words of the Great Commission, because perhaps they might put the same steel in your spine as it does for me. Verses 16 to 18. Context is, Jesus has come back. He's been, a, been still performing a few extra miracles for the last 40 days. He showed himself to many people. The wounds in his hands, the scars in his side. And verse 16 starts with, Now the 11 disciples, those that were following it, there's 11 now, Judas, he's dead. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. That is right and proper and true and good. This is Jesus. He is alive. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But, hear this, some doubted. Some doubted. Some doubted. And after their doubts, the very next line, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Do you have doubts? Look at who Jesus gives this great commission to. There are some that are full-blown worshipping, just on their face, just, you know, they're probably singing oceans or something. But there's also those that doubt. Do you know what this tells me? God can still use someone who doubts to fulfill what he wants them to get done. He can still use a doubtful person. He can still use you. And if that isn't enough, he has this drop mic moment. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority. Now, why might Jesus want them to know that he has all authority? You know, just because they might have missed it up, up to this point. You know, you know, the part where he turned water into wine, okay? The part where he calms the... The ocean and the sea, okay, authority over nature. You know, the part where he casts out demons, okay, authority over the evil spirits, okay, maybe they haven't picked it up yet. A part where he heals the lame and the sick, authority over sickness. Up The part where he, you know, he just, when the Roman soldiers come to arrest him and he says, I am he, and they will just fall back backwards. He's got authority over all of the rulers of the land. Maybe the part where there's dead people and he goes in, he says, what are you doing? Just get out of bed. Oh, wait, no, he's got authority over death as well. Or maybe the part where he himself gets murdered and then he's dead in the tomb for three days, but then he himself comes back to life. He's got authority over his own life. He can, he can lay his life down and he can take it back up again. But just in case he missed, they missed it, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. Not just all strength, not just all power, but all authority. Jesus can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, with whoever he wants. All authority. First up, I think Jesus is probably saying, look guys, uh, listen up. <laughs> listen up and take what I'm about to say seriously. Okay? I've got one last thing for you guys. All authority, remember? All authority. But then secondly, more importantly, Jesus, when he says all authority has been given to him, he wants you not to be confident in you. He wants you to be confident in him. All authority. He has all power and all authority. Nothing, no one, no circumstance can stop what Jesus wants. Nothing, no one, no circumstance what Jesus wants to do through you for another. 
He has all authority. We can rest in His authority, the Sovereign One, who will prepare the heart of the one to whom we share. The Sovereign One, who will make a way for the moment, who will organize the divine appointment or the opportunity to be a witness or to be a light or to be a loving, kind minister of the gospel to whoever it is in this world. He has all authority. He is the one who is in charge. He is the one who has the ability to change even the hardest of hearts. He is the one who is in control. He is the one where the box buck stops with him. Jesus promises, I will build my church. We have so much confidence to rest in Jesus' authority. So much confidence when we rest in what Jesus is doing and who he is. It should give us so much confidence to walk out in this wonderful mission that he's called us to, that's already wide within us. So much confidence. How much confidence? My favorite quote in response to the Great Commission from an Anglican priest and missionary to the peoples of India and Persia, Henry Martin, he says, until God is done with me, I am immortal. All authority. So church, we're going to continue to dive deeper into the Great Commission in the next few weeks of January. I hope that in these parting, significant, game-changing words from our Lord Jesus Christ, I hope they will continue to clarify for you the call that God has placed on your life. And I hope that as they do begin to clarify and crystallize, I hope that you will have an even greater joy in your salvation because as you get to bear witness to and share the gospel that has been at work in you, it will become more alive, more real as you journey and deepen your relationship with Christ and as you also get to see Christ at work in the heart of someone else. That is the greatest thrill. Seeing someone come from death to new life. Seeing someone commit their lives to Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism. Someone who makes sacrifices for Jesus because they know that he is worth it. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded, all that he has commanded. And behold, he is with us until the end of the age. If you're here today, uh, if you haven't responded to the invitation of the gospel, perhaps today is the first time you've heard the gospel and you want to know more about that. You want to know what it looks like to journey with Jesus. Please come talk to me after service. I'd love to chat with you. I'd love to begin to help you figure out what the next steps in a relationship with Jesus might look like.